Good morning and welcome to those of you who are who have joined us for today's um, today's webinar uh, on unlocking the power of engagement for nature recovery and nature based solutions. Um, we are just waiting for a few more people to arrive. Um, we've got quite a good turnout for this event, so um, I'll just wait for a few more people to to join us. But welcome to those of you who've joined us already. There are still people joining us, but I think I'm going to make a start now because we don't want to, to run late. So just good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on unlocking the power of engagement for nature recovery and for nature-based solutions. My name's Kay Jenkinson, and I'm from the Lever Hume Centre for Nature Recovery, which is hosting today's event. And, and I should say that this event is also part of the University of Oxford's Green Sustainability Week. So we're very glad to be part of this growing annual initiative. I'm really pleased that you're able to all join us this morning. Um, but before we make a start and introduce our speaker, there's just a little bit of housekeeping I have to run through inevitably. Um, first of all, to say the webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on YouTube and we'll send you the link uh, shortly. We will have time for questions after Caitlin's presentation. So please use the Q&A to post your questions and you can up upvote questions there too. So please use the Q&A, not the chat. Um, and then after the webinar, I'd encourage you to complete uh, our short feedback form. We'll share the link a little later in the chat and via email after, after the event, but it would be really helpful to have your insights. So please do, 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 do join us um, to um, complete that, that, that form. It would be really helpful. Um, and I would just want to say a few words about the Leverhulme Centre for Nature Recovery. So we are based at the University of Oxford and we're funded by the Lever Hume Trust for a total of 10 years up to 2032. So it's our vision to provide um, the research evidence for, uh, for effective nature recovery in a, and a recovery that is delivered in a fair and inclusive way. Um, the Lever Hume Centre is a community of researchers at Oxford and it brings together expertise in social sciences, in ecology, finance, health and uh, AI machine learning disciplines. So this reflects the wide changes that are needed in our society to restore nature to a good state. And we work with communities in the UK, in Ghana and in Kenya. So our research is embedded in practical applications to the challenges of nature recovery and in a, in a variety of landscapes. Now to protect and rebuild nature and biodiversity successfully, then communities need to be supportive and supported involved and engaged and often this involves local communities but it could be other communities communities of practice for instance but today we're really pleased to have Dr Caitlin Hafferty present her work on her recipe for engagement and this is a really innovative guide to delivering positive environmental outcomes by fostering um, inclusive decision making, by building trust, by building transparency, and really empowering communities to, to, to be involved and to make decisions. The report was published, I think, in November last year, and it's on the Lever Hume Centre website. And but this is the first public event that gives you the chance to hear about the 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 um, the work in detail and to ask questions of its author. Now, Caitlin's broad research focus is on effective and meaningful public and stakeholder engagement in environmental decision making processes. So you have a really knowledgeable guide this morning. Um, I'm sure you're going to find her presentation really insightful so, and stimulating. So please post your questions in the Q&A. We will pick these up later. And I think, Caitlin, it's probably over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Kay, and hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining this morning. Um, just before I um, continue, uh, Kay, can you tell me, can you see the little box with the um, people's icons in in the corner? Is that hiding the slides? Or can you see the full slides uninterrupted? You can, perfect. <laughs> just wanted to double check that um, before I end up accidentally covering half of the slides. Um, well, morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, really excited to be able to present on this guidance that um, we published last year. But the idea is to have this as something that's ongoing, something that will improve over time, um, particularly through um, events like this and uh, also kind of testing in real world situations. But really excited to be able to um, kind of talk through the guidance today. Um, and be able to ask um, ask some questions. I could ask questions, answer some questions um, at the end. Um, do tweet about this. Uh, do feel free to screenshot slides. We're going to share the slides afterwards. Um, we'll also share the recording. So there's just kind of no restrictions on um, screen grabbing and, and sharing. I'm very keen to get the word out um, and kind of tailor this guidance to be as useful as possible. So no sort of restrictions little bit about me um, before I continue. Um, I have a background, as Kay said, in um, all things to do with participation in environmental decision making. So the background in geography, very interdisciplinary background. Um, PhD was in environmental planning, and I really focused on um, public and stakeholder engagement in a very broad set of environmental decision making processes in the UK. Um, my PhD was conducted during the pandemic, so I ended up looking at what happens when you switch all of these engagement processes uh, online um, and what's the impact of that for kind of harnessing the most inclusive and effective engagement. Um, my approach as a social scientist is very applied. It's transdisciplinary. So that means that I kind of not only draw from a broad range of academic disciplines, but I'm really, really focused on what has real world impact. So conducting research that's really kind of driven by the best theory, um, but has these kind of practical applied um, actionable impacts. Um, and I've collaborated with a lot of different organisations uh, during my PhD and over the last year or so working at Oxford. Um, as a postdoc in the Leverhulme Centre uh, in environmental social science, um, DEFRA and Natural England, Highlands Rewilding, Latigal, et etc. Um, really on how to kind of embed this best practice or evidence-led approach to engagement. Um, because we've got quite a few people um, in this webinar, um, unfortunately, we can't um, facilitate uh, in person, well, not in person introductions, but more friendly introductions. But um, it would be really awesome if everybody introduced themselves into the chat uh, while I'm talking. It'd um, be really nice to hear sort of who you are, um, your organisation, um, your role maybe, uh, maybe say about why you're interested in engagement, why you're here um, and what you're hoping to get out of the webinar. Um, but I really would encourage you to just, just pop that in the chat. Um, I think it's quite useful as well to be able to connect with others in this webinar. So I presume you're all here because you're interested in uh, environmental uh, applications um, and the role of engagement within that. So it might be nice to be able to um, reach out to other people as well through this webinar. Um, we'll also save the chat and it's quite nice to see who who came along um, and what you're doing as well. Um, so don't be shy, do, do do that in the chat as I am talking. Um, this webinar, I'd like to do kind of three things. Firstly, I'm gonna introduce the background to the recipe for engagement. Um, that covers what engagement is, why it's important to engage, who to engage with, how, when, and at what scales. So this is kind of the real background basis um, that anyone would need to build a process. I'm gonna quickly talk through some engagement and action case studies. So what engagement might look like in practice, in reality. Um, and then there's some more detailed case studies in the guidance. And then I'm going to talk through a very whistle-stop tour through the nine key ingredients that we've suggested in the guidance um, on how to implement engagement in practice. And then we'll have hopefully about 20 minutes or so for questions at the end. Um, there's a kind of Q&A option on Zoom 
Um, so I think do use that to ask the questions um, and then we'll look at that towards the end um, as well. Kay has already fantastically covered this, so where a lot of this research has come from, um, how it's funded. Um, it's part funded by um, the Agile Initiative. So that's a project that looks at how to do interdisciplinary research in a very rapid way for impact in policy and practice. And we did a project last year on scaling up nature-based solutions. And this guidance emerged as, as one of the core outputs from that. So we weren't just interested in looking at traditional academic outputs like papers, but also guidance, policy briefs. Um, and I produced this guidance um, towards the end of it that I've sort of been working on a while um, during my PhD as well. And then obviously the Lieberhume Centre, I won't go into that, but Kay has provided a fantastic uh, introduction, but do check out the website uh, if you're interested. Um, there's some great new Agile sprints started as well. So just as a brief introduction then, I'm kind of assuming that um, maybe everyone in this call will have different levels of experience with engagement, but I'm gonna start kind of um, assuming no prior no knowledge the way that I like to consider engagement, the power of engagement in nature recovery and nature-based solutions is that it offers a pathway to delivering multiple benefits to address multiple sustainability challenges. So it's really kind of like a, almost like a, a, the glue that can kind of bring together multiple different approaches, multiple different stakeholders to tackle these very, very complicated environmental challenges, very multifaceted environmental challenges. This is kind of very widely recognized. So for example, in nature-based solutions, you see this diagram here, really recognizes that nature-based solutions must be kind of with and for people to deliver benefits for not just biodiversity and climate, but for people and equity as well, involving communities and um, indigenous peoples in doing that and using engagement um, and more participatory processes as sort of a, a pathway to achieving that. So that's just one way of thinking about it. I'll maybe think a bit more critically about that later on in the webinar. Um, but for now, I think just kind of imagining engagement as a process by which you can achieve these multiple goals by bringing together lots of different groups and people and working collaboratively. There are lots of different benefits, um, which I'll go into in a bit more detail um, when I talk through um, the different components of our recipe for engagement guidance. Um, my kind of real drive behind wanting to do this guidance there is a ton of guidance out there so I've designed it to be very very flexible very complementary to existing guidance and efforts so you can kind of pick what's most relevant and what can build on existing approaches but I really wanted to create something that kind of pushed back on this view of engagement as something that's some very prescriptive steps and stages moving up a ladder moving across the spectrum um checking you know nine things for best practice that's kind of not the point of the guidance the point is that it's very flexible can build on existing efforts can adapt to available capacity and capability of organizations and projects so something that I really realized during my PhD through working with lots of kind of government oriented environmental organizations was this capacity issue. And I think that's something that you don't necessarily um, understand in depth if you haven't worked in those organizations. So I think it's all very well suggesting that everybody should do these amazing engagement processes, but often the funding or the skills isn't there. So it's thinking about what can we do within the resources that we have, but build on and work towards this long-term plan of improvement and have the knowledge to be able to do that. So that's the real kind of push and drive behind this, this guidance. And there are some kind of key questions that you can ask yourselves. There's some key components that can kind of following the recipe analogy. Um, I don't know how everybody cooks, but I'm quite a messy, chaotic cook. I'll kind of look at my cupboards and think, what do I have? What don't I have? Um, if I don't have the things that the recipe is suggesting, I'll kind of mix it out with something else. So that's the kind of idea behind it. You can kind of mishmash and work and adapt um, to different project capacities um, and thinking about the kind of tools that you have available as well. So really encouraging this kind of flexible, adaptable process and, and being able to learn from mistakes as well, which I think is so key. The recipe for engagement is aimed at kind of anybody, um, anyone who is 
thinking about engagement, anybody who might already be engaging a bit in their work, really kind of embracing the fact that engagement really is um, understood in very diverse and different ways across different fields, across different organisations. And that's OK, that's inevitable. So it's embracing this diversity, offering some kind of broad thinking points that can be adapted to different situations, kind of regardless um, of experience. And one of the things that I really would like to do in the future and that I welcome any questions or feedback on, we've got a feedback form um, after this webinar, um, and I'd like to set up a kind of a, a community of around engagement and nature recovery and nature-based solutions um, kind of through this work. Um, but I'd like to sort of adapt this to maybe particular areas. So for example, projects that are looking for particular types of funding or projects that are trying to achieve a certain kind of policy mission or perhaps community led grassroots projects um, as well, um, or uh, kind of adding different aspects of the guidance to target particular groups, particular stakeholders. So for example, farmers or children and young people. So the idea behind it is that it can be kind of, we'll move it hopefully, I'm planning maybe in the future, um, to move it from a very static PDF form to something that's a bit more editable. So you can add kind of different components um, as time goes on. Um, that's kind of the, the, the dream. Um, very quickly, kind of before I go on, um, I, I did receive these very nice quotes um, from people who have used the recipe for engagement already in their work and kind of built an organisational strategy um, around it. Um, one uh, project manager who was involved in uh, nature recovery strategies said that they just found it very, very kind of supportive instead of overwhelming and quite like how kind of pragmatic and, and realistic it was. So I think, again, kind of touching on my point that a lot of guidance can perhaps be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit too much within certain capacity constraints of projects. So really trying to encourage a bit more of a, a flexible way of thinking, because I think that that's maybe a bit more in encouraging. I think engaging can be a very you know, nervous position for some um, people to be in. Not everybody uh, kind of has that knowledge and that skill. Um, so I think it's quite nice to be able to approach something um, slowly and kind of understand precisely what engagement means and how you can improve going forwards. Um, the recipe for engagement has also kind of fed into um, Highlands Rewilding strategy for engagement. Um, there is kind of a relative company of, of NEP Wildland. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard it in this um, uh, Zoom call. Um, but they've sort of taken some principles and adapted this to their organisational needs and um, other organisations have done as well. And it's really nice to hear kind of, you know, which bits are of, of most interest and, and which bits are usable, which bits are not, um, which bits need tweaking. So um, it's always really nice to receive feedback. I'm going to talk through um, what engagement is, why you should do it, who is involved, how you can do it and when. And then I'm going to very, very kind of quite quickly, I think, whiz through the nine kind of steps, because the reason being, I think it might be more interesting to have more time for questions in this particular webinar. And then maybe going forwards, um, future events could focus on kind of one particular ingredient, um, or I'm very kind of happy to um, discuss kind of particular ingredients, um, or do kind of go to the guidance and, and read up on more if one particularly um, interests you. So what is what is engagement in the first place? Um, I always like to ask people what it means to them, um, but I think we maybe don't have enough time for that today. Um, but people, you know, maybe think about it now. Think about what 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 engagement or participation actually means to you and your work. Um, people say lots of different things um, and it's always really interesting to hear the way that I like to think about engagement. The way that I've just start, uh, defined it in this guidance is a kind of a process by which um, people, groups, individuals can choose to participate in decisions which affect their lives. So ideally that would be on their terms, but again, kind of going back to the what's realistic, often decision-making processes are led by an organization. There might be specific um, constraints or limits on what is on or off the table in terms of engaging so it's really important to think this through um, and that's kind of one of the ingredients um, helps uh, you do that engagement to me um, other people say that um, kind of engagement is the broadest term I'd say that it's more a kind of uh, focused procedural way of describing participation and I would consider participation to be kind of 
a massive umbrella term that includes all kinds of theories and concepts and approaches and um, participation more of like a yeah a theory and engagement more of a procedure but feel free to disagree with me um but for the purpose of this webinar you know really kind of we're going to be talking about encompassing loads of different types of approaches so you probably heard words like co-design consultation collaboration and co-production um so we're kind of wrapping it all into one here but really kind of explicitly thinking about the differences between different types of engagements in terms of um, to what extent do participants have agency to impact that final decision-making outcome? To what extent um, are they able to engage on their own terms? I think that's the core thing to really think about. So I always kind of show this spectrum. Um, maybe there are some critiques around its use, um, one of which is that it does kind of push this very prescriptive way of thinking about engagement and that you can kind of move up a ladder or move across the spectrum. But I do think that it, it, it does its purpose. It's a very clear way of communicating this. So you can see it kind of moves from one end, which is more informing or consulting with people. So that might be telling people, raising awareness of a project, communicating about environmental issues um, or interventions that you're introducing on your sites, um, right the way towards really using the resources as an organization or a project to empower from the bottom up. So this might be entirely led and self-governed by local communities, for example, farmers, for example, businesses, right from the bottom up. Um, so there are kind of a various approaches in between there, but the core thing is um, this handing over of decision-making power, this empowering from the bottom up. Um, so the kind of one core takeaway is, you know, engagement is all about power all about power. Um, if you want to have a look at some definitions, um, I put a big list of definitions in the recipe guidance. So um, do feel free to have a look. Um, very interested if you agree, disagree, um, would find it in different ways. Um, I've included these myths about engagement because I often um, kind of come across them when I'm um, working so lots of things that I often hear about engagement and also about the social sciences more broadly um that I think it's quite useful just to tackle kind of straight on um that it's irrelevant um so often in the environmental sector it's very focused on maybe biophysical aspects of environmental change but kind of going back to those images that I showed of you know nature-based solutions and broad sustainability goals um this is, you know, this is all about multiple goals. Environmental problems are very, very complicated and always have been and always will be fundamentally linked with people and society. So I often see that kind of, you know, oh, engagement can't be relevant for this project or the social aspect isn't relevant. Maybe that's because you're not funded to do it. And that's perfectly understandable. Um, but I think kind of this is all about kind of really embedding this social, this people aspect, right, really at the heart of environmental decision making alongside maybe climate and biodiversity, ecological aspects. And there are, as, as hopefully you'll see through this webinar, um, a lot of very tangible direct benefits that can be achieved from engagement and also ways to mitigate risks. And there is a lot of evidence behind that. So for example, there was a big study recently that analyzed 305 different case studies of environmental projects that used engagement. And they did find evidence that it improved actually environmental outcomes as well as other benefits um, like improved trust. And going back to that power thing that I mentioned, the number one predicting factor of better environmental governance outcomes was handing over power. Um, that's uh, oh, the paper is Newegg et al. Um, it's referenced in the recipe book um, if anyone wants to go have a look. Um, it's a nice paper. So it does have very kind of tangible evidence-led benefits. Um, I'm going to kind of whiz through these, um, but some of the ones that I hear maybe most is that engagement is all about kind of harnessing support, bringing people on board, changing minds, changing opinions. And while that can be true, so think about kind of the maybe lower ends of that spectrum that I just showed, it's one very specific type of engagement. Engagement is about much more than just increasing support for a project. It may be starting with um, other people's needs rather than projects needs. It might be kind of a mishmash of all of them at various different steps and stages of project decision making. So it's really important to be aware that perhaps different ways of engaging do really go above and beyond communication, education, increasing access to land, for example, in green space. So it's really about broadly about democratic decision making and democratizing 
the way in which decisions are made about our environment and our land, which is super important. Um, another kind of myth, I guess, is that anybody can do it. An engagement um, is not based on science. It's something that's kind of maybe can just be added on to the end of a project and conducted by um, existing members of staff. Well, that could be true in some circumstances, and I'm a big kind of proponent of upskilling and um, building confidence um, in existing kind of people who are involved in the project to engage. I think that often it can be kind of just just added on to pre-existing roles where in reality, this does require some very specific skills and expertise. Um, so, for example, professional facilitators, engagement experts, there's a massive consultancy sector for engagement in the UK and internationally. And then you've got social scientists like me who might look at the best ways to open up and democratise decision making processes, might provide evidence um, like that paper that I mentioned for how to understand engagement. So um, another massive one is that engagement is always going to slow things down and that maybe democracy is a luxury that we can't afford in times of urgency and crisis. But I would perhaps, while I would agree that this is a very urgent, um, you know, environmental issues are very, very urgent and do need addressing urgently. Um, I think that engagement is a fundamental part of doing it. And I'm not sure we can do it actually without um, considering these aspects. So maybe something to talk about um, at the end um, of this webinar. I've kind of covered quite a lot of these, so I might just go through um, quickly ish. But there's a very kind of well established policy um, and legal background for why it is important to engage. Um, so all of this information um, is in a bit more depth in the guidance, but there's a lot of kind of international and UK focused laws and policy objectives as well that really recognise that we need to address environmental problems that are inherently complicated and involve multiple different aspects, human, non-human, biophysical. And therefore, we need a very collaborative, integrated process to actually address that. And I think engagement is just one way of thinking about that. And that's recognised kind of across the board. I increasingly see engagement even in green finance um, sort of standards and certifications, as well as um, in, in policies like uh, environmental land management, local nature recovery strategies. So maybe kind of there's a, a movement, I don't know, um, towards calling for more engagement, but I think maybe a barrier to that is often often this lack of capacity or maybe lack of explicit um, funding mechanisms um, for engagement. In terms of benefits and risks, there are a lot and there's a lot of evidence behind it as well. And I think kind of instead of going into each of these benefits and risks in depth, because it's really just going to change depending on the context and um, potential benefits could be, you know, building trust, um, helping to resolve conflicts, helping to promote pro environmental behavior and shared learning um, between different stakeholders, integrating local and scientific knowledge and so forth. There are lots of risks, um, eroded trust, um, more conflict hindering this kind of aspirations to achieve equity and social goals, um, neglecting diverse viewpoints and different pathways maybe to achieving um, these goals of your nature-based solutions or nature recovery projects, whatever they might be. Whatever the benefits and risks are, it's all about navigating them. So engagement can be thought of as a process that's really, you know, think about it as a scale that's really kind of trying to get the balance right on the um, benefits and the risks we know that we're never going to maybe um, involve everybody uh, in, in a decision making process that's led by an organisation, particularly if there are constraints. We know that perhaps some risks like conflict might not be entirely unavoidable, and that's inevitable. That's absolutely OK. And in fact, I often sometimes suggest that conflict is a, is a good thing. Um, you know, we need to have healthy debates, healthy democratic discussion around this, even if people have completely different views we need to find ways to actually embrace that and navigate this in a way that's productive while still kind of you know working towards an end goal perhaps um, but being able to embrace that complexity throughout decision making processes there are loads of different ways to identify who to engage with in the first place um, so I've kind of suggested, I think I've included the, the three eyes um, way of identifying different stakeholders or groups. Um, this could include, I think it really depends on the organizational context. So some organizations might tend to engage with the scientific community and investors more. Some might be very community focused. Some might be more focused on perhaps environmental, non-governmental organizations um, or engaging with government. 
some might be very focused on farmers and landowners some might be embracing all of these um which is amazing and i'd love to hear if anyone is um so there are lots of different ways to kind of identify who who could or who should and i think the number one thing i'd say is is try not to be too prescriptive with this i think sometimes maybe project constraints will push you in directions of certain stakeholders um but i think it's quite important to consider particularly if the nature-based solutions or nature recovery projects involve decisions regarding land and land use change i think it's important to think about um you know who else could be interested or affected um, or impacted by the project um, and that's as a core part of um of one of the ingredients as well how to engage, I've got two specific ingredients on this, but I think the core point here is that there's a difference between models and methods. Models it would be something like that spectrum that I showed you earlier, um, and that's kind of telling us about what works for engagement. So what are the kind of components that could lead to particular outcomes, whether that's collaboration or co-design, um, whether that's building trust. And they can really kind of help us think through maybe the factors that predict good or better outcomes and also the factors that might influence risks and essentially how to navigate that, how to balance um, the scale. So there are loads of different methods and we'll share these slides afterwards, but I've included lots of different hyperlinks here to different resources. Um, they're also in the guidance, but there is an absolute ton of um you know, different models, different processes out there. And I would encourage to kind of think, you know, I've tried to be quite holistic and in inclusive with the recipe guidance um but there is a lot of other kind of maybe more specific guidance so for example um there's guidance around engaging in natural capital projects or there might be guidance on engaging with um farmers land managers etc and then there are methods so these would be like the tools and techniques so um we're using an online method at the moment um you could also do you know the traditional kind of in-person facilitated events um you could use a citizens assembly so i went along um to the people's plan for nature last year which was amazing to see that in action um and that's another method so there's sometimes kind of blurred boundaries between methods um and models um but i think it's important to kind of realize the distinction between them um, the reason why is because often I see a lot of engagement processes going kind of methods first. And I think, um, you know, methods are not going to guarantee good outcomes um, in all situations. And it's really important to think about kind of the context behind that and the approach. So, for example, some methods like social media might be better at just communicating and educating people. They might not be very good at facilitating co-design, although I have heard of some good examples. There might be other methods that might be better at facilitating co-production and co-design. Um, that might include, but are certainly not limited to things like, um, you know, Zoom, social media workshops. There might be a completely different approach that you need to use in that situation. When to engage is ultimately as soon as possible, um, basically. That's not always possible. Um, and I think it's really important to recognise that. So really keeping in mind that it's better to engage proactively rather than reactively. It's really important to think about how we could do engagement that is locally sensitive while aligning with broader frameworks and standards. But it's also important to be realistic. So for example, if there is something that's um, preventing the super early engagement, or if there is something that's presenting really meaningful local engagement, maybe because there are some very pressing kind of wider frameworks or standards that need to be adhered to, for example, for funding the project, I think it's very important to be very transparent about that and think about that within your team before engaging. So um, I talk about managing expectations a lot throughout um, the recipe book. Um, and I think kind of recognising that regardless of the urgency and maybe regardless of these broader standards and frameworks um in an ideal world there would be maybe more support for kind of empowering facilitating this local um bottom-up forms of engagement so interested to talk about that later as well um these are sort of some just a very small selection of engagement in action studies um Highlands Rewilding is a nice example. I mentioned that earlier. Um, they've sort of taken the recipe or aspects of the recipe and developed their own engagement roadmap. Um, one aspect of their approach is they've actually sold land back to a community near one of their rewilding estates. Um, and they have a community management board that helps kind of influence decisions there. Um, Natagal, they have a project called Booby Wildland in Lincolnshire. Um, we work with the Countryside Community Research Institute um, who led this project, but similarly, they kind of took principles of engagement 
and made their own kind of central guidance um, and have used this to help inform how they're perhaps consulting with the community and communicating in various different ways. There are loads of different ways of engaging. So for example, um, the North Arras Trust or Hogacre Common is a nice example of um, this as well in Oxford. Both of these are entirely community owned and led projects. They may kind of get resources and support from other organizations, but they're 100% driven from the bottom up. So thinking about that spectrum, they might be at the far end of this entirely self-governed aspect. And if you're a very well-resourced organization, it might be interesting to think about, well, if we're working in this space, how can we kind of build on what's already existing in terms of community-led efforts? Um, so Wild Oxfordshire is a nice example of that. They bring together loads of different organizations across Oxfordshire, um, government, private sector, charities, um, community groups, um, kind of bring them all together and look at kind of how, how we can work together collaboratively and as a collective with lots of different organizations um, across a county to work together for nature in various different ways. Um, and what else did I include? I included the Plymouth Natural Grid. I really like this one because they seem to have managed to do integrated um, social and ecological monitoring in quite a nice way, blending qualitative and quantitative data. So I would, um, if you're interested in that, would encourage you to dig out their report. They've got some nice information about how they've achieved this and worked really meaningfully, um, I think, with um, marginalised groups um, within um, Plymouth. If you have any other examples, do share them as well. Always really keen to hear. Right, I'm going to go through the nine ingredients. I'm going to do this quite quickly because keeping an eye on the time, I would love at least sort of 15 minutes or so for questions at the end and to wrap up. Number one, I think this is absolutely, you know, if you are ever, essentially you're going to approach these nine ingredients, hopefully having a good understanding of the what, why, who, how and when that we've just spoken through. So you're starting with number one, kind of understanding the context. Hopefully you've already got a good understanding of what engagement is, what your organisational kind of constraints and limits might be, um, what your aspirations are and that kind of thing. Maybe what levels of engagement you might be working at. I think number one is, is take this context led approach to engagement. So I mentioned earlier, kind of the whole purpose behind the recipe is to promote this kind of context dependency of engagement. This fact that it really is going to change depending on who you're engaging with, where you're engaging, um, why and so forth. So really taking this kind of context led approach. Um, what the context might look like is kind of existing sort of various um socioeconomic factors I'm thinking you know if you've got a piece of land and you're thinking about engaging there might be a national context that you're working at and there might be an international context in terms of um, what you're trying to achieve with the project but there also is inevitably going to be a local context as well particularly if there's kind of land involved um, in that um, and I would say kind of it's very important to almost think about this maybe as a baseline or part of the baseline to help understand the existing context. And I've suggested some ways in which this could be done um, in the recipe. But ultimately, it's kind of really pushing against this view that there can be this very rigid kind of cookie cutter approach to engagement that could be lifted up and put down somewhere else and then lifted up and put down somewhere else. While we can have some key questions and some key guiding principles that, that can be scalable and that can be applied to different areas, I think one of those is this kind of taking this context first approach and how can we do this in a way that's really locally sensitive while perhaps thinking about how this aligns with, with our broader objectives, with our broader goals and frameworks, whatever they might be. So really kind of pushing back on this one size fits all. Something else that I've suggested, um, and this has been super helpful kind of working with collaboratively with lots of different organisations um, and over the last year or so, is coming up with a statement of purpose. And I think this really helps um, people kind of jog, you know, what are the organisational limits? What capacity do we have um, to deliver this? Um, can we, for example, co-design the entire process or maybe aspects? To what extent are we able to hand over power to, to different kind of actors? Um, how can we be realistic and transparent to kind of manage these expectations around what is on or off the table in terms of decision making to avoid over promising and under delivering as well? And I spoke through this a bit earlier, but there are loads of different methods as well to identify relevant parties. And I think um, 
sometimes people can get quite stuck on this and get really fixated on how can we make this the most representative process possible and I think maybe it's a bit blunt of me to say this but I think it's impossible to have a truly representative process I think even the most well-designed citizens assemblies that are very systematic in terms of collecting representative samples from different populations I think even then you know there are factors that are always going to mean that there are harder to reach voices and I think starting from that standpoint can be really useful because that can help be kind of realistic maybe take away some of that thing that's a bit overwhelming with engagement sometimes but really think about perhaps who's harder to reach and and um what kind of what is your engagement process not doing as well as what is it was it doing um, and at what scale. So I've included a couple of um, kind of methods of doing stakeholder analysis that are quite useful for thinking about who could be affected by or interested in the project. Um, there are lots of different other ways as well. Um, if you've used a useful way, um, do feel free to share it. I've heard of quite a few recently that I think are quite useful, different ways of mapping out different stakeholders across different scales. Another kind of key ingredient is we can link engagement into our monitoring and evaluation processes. So I said earlier that often I see engagement used as something that's just kind of added on to the end of a decision making process. So, for example, if you're leading a rewilding project or a natural flood management project, maybe your final step sometimes could be engage. And that might be to communicate the findings or to um, gain support for the project or something else. Um, I think actually we can bring engagement right to the very start of the project. Um, obviously, again, keeping in mind capacity, but ideally bringing it right to the start and having maybe um, different voices, different knowledges informing this uh, monitoring and evaluation process. So that Plymouth project that I mentioned, I think did this quite well. Um, they actually, I think, included um, engagement as one of their core indicators. So how many people were engaged? Um, to what extent were what local views and values taken into account and empowered um, throughout their kind of um, uh, decision making uh, I think they're different interventions where they had forest projects they had maybe um, kind of a aquatic nature recovery projects as well um, so I think it can be you know engagement can be a really meaningful way to bring that social element into monitoring and evaluation in a meaningful way and that could look like in terms of some specific indicators and metrics that could be incorporated or that could be a bit more loose it could be um, perhaps you know, as a social scientist, I always feel that perhaps the best way to embed the social aspects, people's views and values is not quantitatively. Um, so there might be some qualitative ways in which you could do that. Um, so part of my work actually at the moment is experimenting with a software company called Commonplace um, up in Scotland with Highlands Rewilding to look at how we can integrate this kind of quantitative and qualitative data, how we can bring in different aspects of social data embed it in monitoring and evaluation processes alongside other types of data that might be used for nature-based solutions and nature recovery. Um, so I think, yeah, it's really important to consider that. I mentioned maybe using engagement itself as an indicator. Um, and this is because you can come up with lots of different social indicators and apply them in lots of different sites. But I think very critically, that is going to change depending on the context. So if you had um, an aspect of these indicators that's really focused on harnessing kind of very locally situated knowledges and values, um, aiming to deliver benefits that are perhaps relevant to and a, can, get, can be locked into that local area. So an example might be local jobs or affordable housing or something like that. Um, it will depend on the type of project um, and what you're doing. But ultimately, what are the ways in which we could have this sort of um, you know, these these very set specific factors that we can look at in terms of social and community values, um, integrate that into monitoring and evaluation processes. So um, factors could include well-being, um, it could include extent of engagement, it could include um, job provision and so forth. But then how can we have alongside that this continuous process of co-production? So how can perhaps a continuous process of engagement throughout the decision making process, the project feed into that monitoring and evaluation process? So you know that maybe um, the social indicators that you have 
are also representative of kind of local needs and values, as well as something that's broadly more scalable and um, representative. So I think that's not a straightforward thing, but I think it is it's very doable. And there are lots of interesting um, ways that I've seen this happen as well. Some of the final ingredients um, were around methods. I think I've already kind of covered this um, earlier, but ultimately this is helping you think about what the most effective methods might be. And I think my number one core takeaway on methods is that don't go methods first. I think a lot of projects do. They might think kind of how do we select the right methods to sort of initiate this engagement process. I think that engage, uh, methods and best practices are very overrated in terms of predicting particular outcomes. So it's really important to go context first and the methods fit into that context. So the methods are chosen to, um, to work best for the type of people who are involved. So maybe you will have already thought about the context, you've already thought about who's going to be involved and why, et cetera, before methods are selected, if possible, ideally. Um, and then I've also included a section, this is because um, my PhD was actually on digital engagement, but using digital tech can hugely, hugely, hugely impact the quality and the inclusiveness of the engagement process. So it's really important to think quite critically about how you're using different tools and technologies in the engagement process. Um, and I've suggested some ways to do it. Ultimately, you know, there, there might be certain constraints. So for example, um, you know, might not have tens of thousands of pounds to get a professional engagement software platform. Um, you might want to go for some kind of lower tech options or some, um, you know, for example, if you're engaging with farmers or with young people, there might be some very particular tools um, that the evidence suggests that you should use to engage with, with those groups. So um, some of those links that I shared earlier, um, they come up with some very useful suggestions about how to tailor methods to different levels of engagement and also um, different groups who are involved. And the final two ingredients uh, are quite similar um, and also linked to this monitoring and evaluation process. Uh, I've included this as a separate ingredient for now, um, but I did actually receive some feedback that maybe merging it in with a monitoring and evaluation might make it more straightforward. That would then reduce the uh, ingredients to eight instead of nine. And for some reason, I just prefer having an odd number, but that's just me being weird. Um, but ultimately, really really important to think about evaluating engagement I think so if you're integrating the social whatever that might look like social indicators into a monitoring and evaluation process for your project using engagement as kind of a pathway to do that um, we need to find out whether it's working how do we monitor success so there are lots of different ways of doing that um, I've included I think it's one that's been developed by forest research which is really useful um, that's a social evaluation process, and that helps us think about kind of how to understand different social impacts, how to understand what's caused them, what are the lessons learned, and then sort of how to kind of act on that and um, how to really understand whether your kind of aspirations for engaging and for really embedding social benefits, um, equity aspects into nature-based solutions and nature recovery projects, has this worked? How do we know? Um, so it's important to think about that as well. I think evaluation is often kind of forgotten about in terms of engagement processes. And it's also very tricky to do, um, especially if the project's ended, um, as I always find with my research. Um, and finally, you know, I mentioned I've worked with quite a few organisations already on this um, and that sometimes organisations can be quite capacity constrained in terms of embedding social, embedding engagement um, in their existing projects um, and organisational strategy. And kind of working towards kind of appreciating that, appreciating the constraints, appreciating that perhaps engagement is such a nerve wracking thing to do. People can sometimes be really quite kind of it's a very risky place to be sometimes, um, as well as combined with lack of capacity, lack of capability. Um, I think it's very important to be quite reflexive of that and open and transparent and have a very honest conversation within your project team um, or organisation about this and think about how over time you could build and embed this culture of engagement is what I've called it. Um, I did some work with Natural England on this exact thing and produced a report all on how to embed cultures of engagement within um, environmental organisations. Um, what that might look like is kind of investing in capacity, hiring new staff, upskilling existing staff, 
linking engagement, you know, as a project goal, a very specific project goal or linking it to key performance indicators, um, whatever that might look like. But the core thing is to really think about this as a journey, a journey towards embedding engagement to, um, you know, increasing your organization's capacity to do this. Oh, no, I want to stop talking now because I want to have questions. Um, what I'm going to do is because we're sharing the slides, I'm going to stop talking now. And then we can take some questions. Is that all right, Kay? That's fine. Um, that's great. So thanks very much for that, Caitlin. That was very comprehensive and whizzed through all the loads of information. Um, we've had quite a few questions already. Um, I'll throw these at, at you. Um, and if we can maybe keep it quite short responses and we can get through more, more of the questions if we can. So um, Phil asks, you say uh, that anyone that one of the myths is that anybody can do engagement. So what does one need to engage? What skills are essential? And I think that might be quite interesting in terms of what or skills for organisations and for individuals. Yeah, definitely. Um, that was actually something that I looked at um, both during my PhD and also um, with this project that I mentioned with Natural England. I think one of the core things in terms of skills is, is people skills. And often you kind of have in organisations soft skills and hard skills, technical skills. Technical skills are often kind of prioritised quite a lot. And I think for good engagement, it's appreciating the importance of these people skills. I don't like the word softer skills, um, but that could be, you know, communication, um, teamwork, leadership, empathy, all those kinds of things, active listening, which are skills that are often kind of um, deprioritized within projects or not really thought about or just assumed as something that, you know, everybody has or everybody can do. So I think number one, people skills. And then also where when you can drawing on um, social science evidence. So there's a lot of researchers who literally focus on various different aspects of participatory and collaborative working. Um, and they'll kind of flag things that might be really, really important for good engagement processes. So maybe aspects to do with trust or facilitation skills, um, leadership skills, mentorship, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I maybe say those two things, kind of one, social science evidence or interdisciplinary evidence um, where you can, um, and two, people skills is, is really, really important. And that includes a very broad range of skills. Thanks very much. Um, second question is, um, Jack says, in, in what ways might private capital investment impact engagement in nature recovery activities, especially interested in natural um, capital investment and what consequences there might be for valuing nature in, in the community engagement sense. Yeah, um, I'm weirdly actually writing a paper on this at the moment. Um, I would say ultimately um, the way in which projects are funded, um, that could include kind of various different natural capital um, mechanisms. Uh, also who kind of is leading the project, how the land ownership works, all that kind of thing. That can ultimately, you can think of this as opening up and, and closing down different opportunities to achieving really meaningful um, engagement and participation. Um, one of the ways, for example, if the funding very explicitly focuses on carbon and biodiversity benefits, that might work to downplay the importance of achieving different types of social and cultural benefits and valuing the landscape in different ways. If a landscape is very valued in, in um purely kind of uh, monetary terms, then what does that do to perhaps other more cultural or social values of those landscapes? That's not to say that there is like a good or bad way of valuing or a good or bad approach. That's kind of, you know, what way does kind of the funding or the way in which the fund, the, the project is incentivized kind of, um, yeah, shut off other ways of thinking about things or other ways of achieving these um, project goals or sustainability goals, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, someone else says, are you aware of any research that's been done into the kind of cost savings of good engagement? Are you aware of anything? So comparing the upfront costs of engagement and the cost savings of having a well-designed project. I suppose it's kind of, is, is there, uh, what are the other cost benefits to um, to good engagement? I guess it'd be kind of quite difficult to monitor. But anyway, if you know- Yeah, anything... tr tricky, um, because uh, the reason for that is, so I, for example, came at this um, from, I was just gonna say, Kate, what we could do is kind of go till five past 11 with the Q and A anyone can kind of stay who can do an extra five minutes, then this will all just be in the recording anyway. 
Yeah, yeah and I also yeah. thought if there were ones that we just can't get to, we can all we can always do we can, a, always we can respond after the event. Answer them in a blog post or something. Yeah, you know, that's me. You know, you can practice these webinars as much as you like, but you're always gonna run over by anyway. Um, I'll get it right. Um, so the question about cost savings, I think that's quite tricky because um there it's almost like engaging helps decrease the risk of very kind of costly delays and complications to the project. And that could look like various different things. So a very kind of tangible example is in maybe housing and development or renewable energy and the way in which engagement has been embedded there. So the risks of not engaging at all, and perhaps this has resulted in a lot of conflict, a lot of very high profile um, opposition to projects. There was actually a very high profile opposition to a rewilding project um, in North Wales. And I think that led to one of the core investors actually pulling out um, as well as maybe long term kind of reputational um, considerations for that organization. Um, this is very much something that's been very widely recognized for decades in the planning and development sector. And I think increasingly in the nature recovery and nature based solutions space as well, um, in that, you know, if you don't have good engagement, it's better to think about this as early as possible um, to avoid these kinds of impacts. You know, it, it's much harder to build trust once it's been eroded than work to kind of build that up from the start so I think yeah there are lots of maybe other kind of quite tangible financial benefits I'm seeing increasingly maybe um, carbon credit schemes including this kind of good engagement aspect as part of their certification standards um, so therefore you know one of the core um reasons why you might get the funding might be to demonstrate this kind of social um, legitimacy, um, social license to operate maybe a project. So yeah, very complicated, lots of different financial aspects um, to engaging or not. Great, thank you. Um, George has asked quite an interesting question. Is there any evidence that doing engagement in nature, as in, in outside in, the, in a natural environment has a greater or different impact to to, to compare to being online or inside maybe your digital stuff has some reflections on this yeah I um I've got a preprint of a paper um that's currently in review um that looks at this so kind of comparing online um virtual and in-person engagement um short answer is yes it does impact and impacts on some very specific things so that could be um trust building for example um it can be harder um to build trust online in certain ways um, another example is in terms of the quality of knowledge that you might get. Um, another example is in terms of um, kind of managing expectations as well and communicating. So if you think about maybe the, the core factors that predict good outcomes and engagement is a very kind of crude but accurate way of predicting of, of saying this. Those core factors take on new dimensions in entirely digital and remote environments. That doesn't mean that in every single digital only engagement, you're never going to be able to build trust. That's not true. It really depends on the context. Um, but ultimately, you can think about, you know, good engagement in terms of there are some factors that predict good engagement outcomes. What are they? How do they take on new dimensions in digital environments? So, um, yes, it does. Um, and there are lots of different ways. I think I think I've published a blog post on it. I'm not sure. Um, but very happy to share um, the preprint of my paper and um, yeah aspects. I've, I think I created some guidance on it as well. Um, but yeah, one of my one of my favourite topics. Um, thanks for your oh, that's question. That's good. Um, there's another question here. What is the best example of equitable engagement that you're aware of, where of where the loudest voices don't dominate? I mean, have you got an example? It may not be you know, just one that you were aware of where you were able to bring in those. Um, that that variety of voices i think yeah maybe there's there's two questions within that i think there's the loudest voices dominating and i think that's all about um facilitation within the actual engagement events so if 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 specific engagement activities are, are managed in um by a professional who who literally their job is specializing in how to include and navigate different voices and tensions and if that's done in a very um, good way that can really help with these maybe louder voices that could dominate um, and also looking to you know perhaps cast the net beyond those kind of usual suspects towards um, broader kind of populations and communities and stakeholders. Um, I think the e equity question is interesting. Um, equitable for who is a big question. 
Um, and I think that can look like various um, different things. But for, for me, maybe equity is all about kind of um, how benefits distributed, who's benefiting and why, um, whose voices are recognized in processes and whose aren't. Mm. Um, and then also kind of aspects of, you know, what knowledges are included or not included um, in decision making processes. So, yeah, maybe two two aspects to that in terms of good examples. Um, maybe it's just one that's very fresh in my mind, but I always really like the Highlands rewilding example of um, Tavia Alec, their estate. Um, lots of kind of rewilding initiatives planned there. Um, and there is a very kind of active involvement of community group, um, a land sale back to the community where that's, you know, very tangible equity benefits there in terms of um, community ownership of resources um, and a very kind of democratized decision making structure there with a community management board. Um, so some of those kind of good, good practice um, engagement examples that I shared include various different ways of doing this um, that may or may not involve, um, you know, high levels of engagement. Um, so, yeah that's answered your question thanks um another one here this may depend on whether you you kind of have much knowledge of this the background in particular so we'll we'll see how where we go with this one um jack says it's all kicking off in wales uh be between farmers and the new and new environmental regulation do you think enough was done to engage them it feels very much like things are being done to rather than with um should environmentalists be more in he suggests intertwined with the farming community uh yes short answer um i think that maybe historically the way in which the scientific community and policy community has engaged with farmers has been maybe very kind of that there's been a lot of conflict a lot of tension and i think one of the one of the clashes there is kind of this this scientific both versus kind of local situated knowledge and also another issue has been kind of viewing the farming community as very homogenous. Um, farmers are incredibly diverse. There are lots of different ways to, ex for example, when I was talking about engagement and who to engage with, um, with farmers, there's, you know, they're not just a group like farmers. There's young farmers, older farmers, you know, multi-generational farmers, um, you know, farmers that are more innovative than others. Um, and there's been some amazing research, um, social science research, for example, at the Countryside and Community Research Institute that I mentioned, they're based at the University of Gloucestershire. Um, there's some great research that's come out there is kind of how to engage with like specific groups of farmers. And they've um, done some great reports with DEFRA um, as well on kind of how to co-design with farmers. Um, and I think this is true for other other stakeholders as well. But um I think there's this real need to maybe approach some of these ways in which, you know, we really have to work with with farmers as well as different community groups. You know, the community is an homogenous group as well and will include farmers, too. But we really need to take this kind of ap approach where we're maybe willing to listen to different perspectives and have these mechanisms in place for navigating that. And I think engagement is one way to do it. Um, that doesn't mean that perhaps everybody's opinion is going to be taken into account and delivered on at the end. It's more about kind of how we navigate this um, and how we, you know, build build trust. I think that's one thing that was lacking um, with a lot of kind of the Elms maybe policies around farmers. And it's why there's this big focus on on co-design is this building building trust with farmers and how do we really work with them on, on their terms. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, yeah, area of research. Um, if you can do a really quick one sentence answer to the next one, we can squeeze one more question in, which is, does context first differ from place based approaches? Do we need to align all the different terminologies and social sciences so stakeholders are using, uh, stakeholders are using to create a shared language? So I suppose there's a bit about that, about understanding each other's terms and references. Um, and so it's kind of saying, what's the difference between place based approach or a context first approach? But quick, yeah, quick answer, please. I, I think it's the same the same thing really um I'm not sure that we need to come up with a central language I think that's impossible you know it's not possible with engagement um it's not been possible in other places I think the core approach is basically embracing di the terminological diversity but being clear about what we mean in specific contexts so for example with kind of place-based um a lot of this kind of place-based community-led um guidance and literature would say you know just be really distinct about what place-based community benefits are for example in contrast with broader kind of national or global benefits arising from um kind of nature-based initiatives so yeah 
I hope that's answered that one. Okay, right, well, I think that's, thank you so much for Caitlin for getting through, doing the presentation and getting through those questions. Thank you for everyone who's attended today for your uh, attention and for those questions. We will, I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. We will, um, we'll pick them up and we'll respond to them in some way. It might be a blog, not quite sure yet. We'll work it out. Um, so thanks very much. Um, and we will, uh, I think we probably posted the feedback form um, link and we will also circulate it shortly so if you could please uh, make sure you 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 sign that you uh, you re reflect your thoughts in that that would be really helpful um, and I think there's nothing else except to say thank you very much for your time and um, hopefully we'll see you at another you all at another one of these type events in future any thanks thank you very much for coming thank you